What's up, everybody? How you doing? Come on in. It's Ulysses Owens Jr. I'm here with From the Drummer's Perspective. Uh, you're also checking out a track of mine uh, called London Time from my record, uh, Soul Conversations, my big band record on Outside In Music. But I want you to come on in. Please let me know where you are chiming in from. It's been really cool every week to, to hear from people and hear um, whether you're coming in from Brazil or you know anywhere in Europe or you might even be in New York. I'm currently at Juilliard right now. So uh, I'm here uh, teaching during the week. I'm, I'm fortunate to be small ensemble director. So uh, yeah, so this is uh, my classroom. So you get to see a little bit of what we're doing. Uh, what's up, Peter? Good to see you from Stockholm. I think you've been with us before. So uh, good to see you. Um, for those that are Maybe this is your first episode. Uh, this is a really cool show that we've curated at Open Studio. Uh, man, now I think we're about in three months of running. And the show is essentially about great drummers and artists who also happen to be drummers in their process and our perspective from behind the kid and in the music. Uh, please let me know for those of you that are still logging in. Go ahead and put it in the chat what you wanna want us to know about you and where you're from. Also, if there are questions, What's up, Robert Powell? Um, if there are questions that you have for Matt, uh, can't wait to chat with him. We're going to jump right in in a second. But um, again, this show is something that we've been doing every week. And it's been really exciting to speak to wonderful artists like Nasheed Waits and Terry Lynn Carrington and uh, many others. Louis Nash, Harlan Riley, some of my favorites. Uh, they're great artists. But what's even more paramount is is their sort of mental and sort of uh, philosophical approach to the kit. And I think that's what we all want to know because as musicians, we're always like, okay, I have the instrument or I am the instrument of your vocalist. And you're like, what's next? Like, how do you process thought around how you show up in the music? So continue to let me know where you're from. Uh, for those that are already with me, I want to tell you a little bit about Matt Wilson. Um, every drummer that I've invited on the show is not just someone that I'm a fan of. It's also someone that I've had a chance to meet, in many cases, uh, take lessons with or even interact with. And Matt Wilson is someone I haven't taken a lesson with yet, but I'm I'm going to make sure I, I uh, put him on the spot and ask him about that when he comes on. But uh, these drummers are people that I've had an opportunity to take in what they do musically and artistically in person. And, and it's always left kind of an indelible mark um, in my mind and also my playing. Uh, Matt Wilson is somebody who inspires me on many different levels. And I'll just briefly state a few different ones. One is as a drummer, you know, Matt is one of the most creative uh, beings on the planet. And he's obviously incredible, you know, as an entrepreneur and, and, and pushing his vision forward. But just as a drummer, before you get into the other aspect of, of his playing and his presentation, he is someone that has a gorgeous touch on the instrument. He's someone who also has a very uh, beautiful tradition and foundation in how he approaches the instrument. He's also someone, every time I see him play, whether it's online or in person, he's always pushing the music forward. He's someone who is incredibly aware of where the music is, but he's also making very conscious statements about how to move it forward. Um, second, as a band leader, because um, many of you may know I'm a, you know, a band leader and have been one for the last probably – Actively, I would say about the last four or five years, uh, Matt Wilson is someone that I look up to because as drummers, there's not as many band leaders um, out there on the scene. And he's been doing it very successfully for over a decade. I would even arguably say a couple decades. And so watching how he navigates the industry as a drummer and band leader and concept creator is also really important. And then I would say lastly, as an educator, he's someone that I really look up to and uh, he's doing great things. He's been on the cover of tons of magazines um, and, and you'll hear rightfully so why. Uh, the other thing I like about him is he has a great sense of humor in the music, but don't mistake that for his lack of seriousness. He is incredibly serious about his craft and also serious about the state that he wants to make in the industry and you can really feel that in everything that he does even the things that come across um more so fun um but he, i have the highest respect for him and i think he's someone who i'm excited for all of us to learn from and to hear a little bit about his journey but he's one of the greatest one of the most inventive and when i think about his playing i think about the words freedom um, he's always incredibly free with his expression so uh thanks again i see we got reggie sylvester and we got um some folks from, uh, I see it's Clown321321 from Warsaw, Poland, which I love Poland, tuning in. So continue to drop those uh, locations in the chat. But anyway, I want to welcome one of the most creative and innovative beings who happens to be a drummer and incredible uh, band leader, Mr. Matt Wilson. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now what? No, I'm just. But thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Ulysses. Thank you so much. And, and uh, and again, I, I I put that up up there yesterday of you being, you know, uh, you know, a provider of positivity and a positive oh. spirit for what we're doing. So, you know, in this world, we need you know less division and more people that are bringing things together. So, on behalf of myself, I'd like to thank you know you and and, and Open Studio and this forum because you know. The anthropology of this is, is you know, I, I, I stress this to students all the time is that, you know, you, you, you want to look, this is all about stories, you know, and so, right, right. You, you know, you, 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 everybody has a story and you, right. they, I want them to preserve theirs. Right. And I also want them, you know, to know and add to theirs, but also gain from all these other people's stories. So, right. you know, I live, for, I live for that. You know, I live for hearing stories and anecdotes about people and things and situations and all that. So right. you just collect these things and yeah. you know, provide them for, you know, for the next generation or for next people to know about. So it's fun. No, it's great, it's great, man. So so we're going to dive in, man. You know, as I was saying earlier, you're so incredibly innovative. And I feel like with a lot of the other drummers that I've had on the show and that I continue to talk to, um, you can kind of see their lineage. You know, you could say, hey, they've checked out Kluk or they've checked out Vernell. You know, tell us what is kind of that first inspiration a as a drummer that inspired you to play the, the kit and, and inspired how you show up in the music? Well, there's, there's you know, there's a lot of those. But I mean, the, the, the first one was, um, there was there's an episode of of the Lucy show where wow <laughs> I wasn't expecting that <laughs> where where it was the 70s you know early 70s yeah. I was in like first grade or second second grade actually and and there's an episode where where um, Ricky Jr. is going to be in this drum contest and Lucy who's he was a very good drummer he's a very good drummer mm -hmm. and so he he just Lucy has this idea that he should take a lesson so they go and see Buddy Rich play at this club wow. and 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 the story he she he has a symbol bag that looks like Lucy's purse you can see this wow. on YouTube yeah. and they bring it home they realize that they have they have his symbol so he had to come home to the house so he comes and knocks on the door and he sees this drum set and Buddy sits down and plays the drum solo you know wow. etc yeah, yeah that's what I mean but I was always, I, I, my parents weren't, my parents, I mean, we'll talk about that later as far as my parents are so incredibly supportive and, and really imaginative people, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and um, uh, really creative and so the, and resourceful, but they, but they didn't, they, they, they saw this in me and they, they had, we had records, not jazz records, but just music records. And they took me to a lot of things. Okay. But what, but the real turnaround was I had a friend in high school, well, this is junior high at this point, and and um, he's a doctor now. I mean, and we were both farm kids, so he he had we would listen to records, and he I would bring records. I was starting to get records, and but he had this record called Rich versus Roach because I, mm. you know, I was funny, and that totally changed my life. I mean, this is the opening cut of Louis Prima Sing Sing Sing. You know, arrange these those were arrangements by Gigi Grice. Actually, Jimmy Cobb told me he was at that session. What? Of course, the great. Yeah, he was at the date. Julian Priester is on that record. Wow. Yeah. You know, so I've talked with him about it. And um, so I heard that. I heard he, he I didn't know this, but he, he plays with the bass playing. You know, he, his buddy plays the first solo and, you know, just rips it up. Right. Know. But I heard Max and it really sang to me. I mean, my ears just went. <laughs> you know, I remember the day like it was yesterday. I remember wow. where what it looked like in, the, in his bedroom with the, with the hi fi system and <laughs> everything. And, and that was it. You know, wow. I just heard that sound and I heard that way of now I didn't. And he's actually playing over the changes, you know, yeah. of the tune. And I heard that and I was, man, that's wow. that to me is that again, I didn't know what that was, but I was drawn to it. Mm -hmm. So I heard that. And then, you know, my parents took me to a lot of things. The same friend um, and I one time we were I was 15. He was 16 in one week, Ulysses, in mm -hmm. in West Central Illinois in this mostly yeah. just corn yeah. we we drove 50 miles north and we saw clark terry we we drove two nights later we drove 50 miles south to western illinois university and saw dizzy gillespie's wow. quartet with ed cherry bob cranshaw and a very young and happening tommy campbell whoa and then th three nights later we went down to the university of illinois and saw oscar peterson play solo so that's some heavy music bro yeah <laughs> if we, we, didn't, we didn't we didn't have this machine to find this stuff out we would right in, in the week in the newspaper every week they'd have like a tv guide about what was going to be on 
And then, and they had a little art section and they would just show what was happening in the area. Wow. So I saw, I met Count Basie and Freddie Green when I was with him, the same guy. We saw Buddy. We saw um, a bunch of people. My parents took me to a lot of these too. And then there was a lot of workshops. So Louis Belson, Mr. Belson uh, was from Quad Cities, Illinois. So he was around the area a lot. And I got, wow. to, he got to, I got to know him Man. and he was always very supportive and and, I, and people may not hear a lot of that in, in but you, a lot of his sound is in is in the sound that I offer. Like his, his I, I mean, as much I, I like Buddy, but I like Louis' sound is so warm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and the way yeah. he the way he the way he played the drum, you know, the way he stroke, yeah, I was very much an influence about with the rebound and the movement. Right. I didn't know that. I just watched it, you know, but right. he, and he got such a, a great, great sound. And then that's one of the reasons I became a composer because he was a guest at the Western Illinois University Jazz Camp. And it was a thrill just to be around him. But one day I was, I was a Saturday morning. I was just wandering around the campus. And there he is in the band room at the school wow. with score paper. And I Whoa. walked in. I was like, oh, I said, sorry, sir. I don't mean to interrupt. He goes, no, come on over. Hmm. He goes, I'll show you what I'm working on. And he was working wow. on a chart. And he was saying, well, I'm working on this saxophone solely. And he was playing some things, ideas, and putting them in. And now I said, "Wow, that's it. This is I want to do that too." <laughs> Man, you so know, you, I, sorry, you bring up two things that 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 I, I want you to unpack a little bit because I, I talk about Buddy as well. Buddy was very influential and to to me. He was actually the first jazz drummer I heard. But I feel like in jazz, he he gets this interesting rap because you know he was so large. I was actually hanging with Bill Cunliffe the other day, who, who played with Buddy. Yeah, and he talked about him. So I'd love to hear you talk more about him. And also with Louis, I feel like Louis Belson was one of the greatest drummers, but I kind of feel like he's a little bit unsung. Like he had this large personality, but I kind of feel like Buddy is always going to go down as the, the greatest drummer in history. But Louis was equally, you know, or arguably doing some of the greatest things as well. So can you go a little deeper? Oh yeah, I mean I. Man, I saw him one night at the University of Illinois hmm. play a snare drum thing. Wow. I mean, we were sitting above, you know, the Craner Center. I don't know if you've ever played there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had these seats where we were over the band. It's thrilling to even think about it. So he's hmm. he's doing this. <laughs> and he brings it down, and he brings it down, and he brings it to the he brings it to the very edge of the head near the rim, and it's like this in this beautiful hall. Wow. Then he takes it, he brings it to the room and you just hear, and man, I was like, wow, artistry. Wow. I mean, it was this, it was this scene, Heifetz or wow. the artistry that he got. Yeah. And one time he was at Wichita state and he was in a really good mood. So we had a chance. It was about seven or eight days before he had the heart attack in, in Ann Arbor. So this would have yeah. been 84, maybe wow. 83. Wow. And then the last time I saw him, I think Bill was playing, and they played a lot of piano trio hmm. with brushes, and it was great yeah. to check him out. You know, he had this really cool. He had this really interesting thing that I caught from him that night, where he would hmm. he would at tempos like this, and maybe a little yeah. bit faster, he would sweep, but he would also fill in the two triplets. So I don't have the stuff in front of me, but he would yeah. instead of going, and have this churn to it that was really Ooh. great. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, so Mr. Was the guy. Mr. Belson, you know, a lot of things happened because of him. I met, he was playing with a, a band, check this out, at a mm. dinner theater my brother was uh, a technical director at, with a band with um, Gary Novak, who just passed, a great pianist from mm -hmm. Chicago, wow. uh, whose son is Gary Novak, the great drummer. I was wondering if there was a, a connection yeah. between those two, yeah. And Larry, Larry and Rusty Jones were... Uh, I'll talk about Rusty in a second too. Rusty was a great drummer, left-handed drummer in Chicago, and uh, and he was an influence on me too because I met him at a workshop, and he was the first guy. I, it was the first time I had ever seen an 18-inch bass drum in a flat ride before. I was like big band drummer kind of person, you know. And I heard, and he really, and so years later, I was playing in Chicago at the showcase with Denny's Island. And he came with Larry, and I said to him, I said, you know, sir, the reason I have that flat ride is because of you. The reason I have that cowbell is because wow. you had this cowbell thing that he showed. He was a very imaginative guy. I played with George wow. Shearing. Mary McPartland. I was just talking about him the other night with a pianist, a uh, bass player from that, that played with him a lot in wow. Chicago. Wow. But Mr. Belson, but, and then, so listen to, and George DeVivier was playing bass. Wow. And an 18 year old Ted Nash. Wow. So that's how you got connected to Ted. I met him when I was 14 years old. Wow. Wow. And man. so I heard him and I, and you know, and then through the years I'd run into him and et cetera, et cetera. So that, and I still, you know, I've been 
I play with him. I just played with him a, a month or so ago, and I've got some stuff coming up with him. So, and made a, wow. a little bit on his records and stuff like that. So it was right. great, right? But Mister, yeah. the great thing about Louis Belson is that, well, first of all, he's like the, one of the nicest guys in the world, and mm. if not the, and he would bring characters to life. He, he, he played brushes. You'd hear him under his under, under his breath go, "I'm a tap dancer." Are you serious? <laughs> and he'd go to, you know, and, he, and in, you know, in his solo, you know, he yeah. go. To, He'd go to the hi hat, and he'd go, "I'm oh, Joe Jones." Whoa, 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 whoa! And so I always thought that I was imagining this. So I said to Ted, "Was it? Did he really do that?" He was, like, "Yeah, he did that." Wow, wow, man, that's deep. Yeah, but man. Louis man on some other dates, you know, some great records. The record, um, uh, it's on Impulse, called they do Cottontail really fast on it. I think it's called Thunder. Something has a. He, it's maybe probably the only maybe the only record okay. he might have done for Impulse, wow. but it's a really really cool record, you know. And uh, so, yeah, he was a, he was a real influence. And then then other people would come around and and um, and I went to this percussion symposium in between my junior year and senior year of high school that was sponsored by Ludwig Drums up at hmm. uh, Madison, Wisconsin University, of Wisconsin Madison, and Alan Dawson was there. Wow. And uh, Carmine Apathy, you know the whole thing, wow. but. Um, but that's where I met J.C. Combs, Dr. J.C. Combs, and that's why I went to Wichita State because he was wow. teaching at this, and I was blown away. I know by the by the imagination of this guy. So, you know, I tell students all the time. I think you want to have people that help you with your craft of your instrument, hmm. and you want to have people. You want to find teachers and mentors to help you with your imagination and your creativity. Whoa. And hopefully, sometimes you're lucky to find that person is the same person. But in my case, I had like all these different people that I would draw upon. And the great thing about Dr. Combs was that he was, you know, everybody still digs him, you know? So that's how I met Jeff Hamilton. That's how I met. Wow. Uh, that's how I got hooked up and studied with Ed Sof. That's how wow. I met Buster Williams, and I, you know, all wow. because of, you know, all this. And Danny Gottlieb, we, he, we right. brought people in. People would just come because they wanted to hang with him, you know? Wow. And of, of all the percussion instruments, not just drum set, but, you know, Lee Howard, you know, uh, Gordon Stout or, you know, this person or that person. So you, it, we had a great scene going on there between 80, 82 and 86. I was around some of the most creative people, you know, of my peers were just so imaginative and trying things and we would push things, you know, we, mm. we so we, when we were there, we did the piece with concerto war games, the concerto for, uh, for percussion ensemble, professional wrestlers. We did a piece. <laughs> yes, what? it's true. <laughs> Hold yeah, on. yeah. You can't you can't just say stuff like that, Matt. You got you got to tell us more about that. No, I mean, he's, a ge- <laughs> he's a genius. It was composed by a guy named Walter Mays, a Pulitzer wow. Prize, you know, nominee c- composer. And you know, we did this piece, and and we did it at the uh, we did we did it one time at the PAS convention in 1983 at um, Knoxville, Tennessee. We did the piece, and the wow. wrestlers didn't show up, so he luckily found wrestlers at a bar somewhere in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they came and did the piece. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I was there, you know, and the Wichita Festival would come in and that's how I met, you know, uh, Bill Goodwin and Dennis Chambers and John Schofield. I met there for the very first time and Kenny Washington. Mm. He was there with Johnny Griffin's first time I met Kenny. You know, and we, and we would talk, we would hang with guys. I hung out with my buddy and I hung out with Mel Lewis from after the festival until he had to leave for the airport on Monday morning, all night in his hotel. Tell us about that, man. Oh, man, it's great. Or, or I should say the, the 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 parts that you can tell us. <laughs> no, there, no, there, there, it was all cool. Okay. He, he just he, it was he had a, he had like a Walkman with speakers. The first time I seen that, he was playing his stuff with the, with the band, and, and uh, he gave us he, one of his greatest words of advice I ever got was there. He said, "No, you know, fellas, I never have a bad night. I just have better nights than others." That's it was great, man. And you know, I had heard I had just seen him not in, not playing, but. My my girlfriend, who later became my wife, she passed away, you know, seven years ago. Mm-hmm. But uh, we were in New York uh, on a vacation, you know, on a spring break, and we went to see um, we went to see Peter Erskine playing with a band at Seven Avenue South. But we went to see uh, Red Rodney, Iris Sullivan mm-hmm. at um, the Vanguard, and as, I had been the Vanguard the summer prior uh, because that's another story. I saw Elvin Jones and Philly Joe Jones the same night, but I was leaving <laughs> and I saw Mel. I saw Mr. Lewis. And I said, "The said that's Mel." So, and she says, "Why don't you say something?" And because I talked to everybody, and yeah. and I said, "I don't think he's supposed to be very nice." 
Jones. So when I, <laughs> when I went, when he said, when, I'm a college kid. So he goes, well, why don't you say hi? I said, well, I, I said it to him. I said, I innocently, you know, said, I don't, I, I thought you were supposed to be a very nice guy. <laughs> and then he just laughed, but he, wow. he heard me play. And I, and, and I had, you know, I had my old K's and I was, you know, I was, yeah. and I'd been working on stuff. He goes, Hey, young man. He goes, and so he, and, and there was a bass player that I was playing with in town that knew him from territorial band days named Herm Garst, who's a great mm. bass player who I think is on some like really uh, obscure, um, um, the singer, um, I'll think of her name, okay. uh, records, you know, and um, uh, Blossom Deary, like mm. some European stuff, because he might have, because I don't think that name's too common. He's a really good bass player, and it, they knew each other. And so he, you know, he kind of uh, facilitated it. So we, we hung out that whole whole weekend. Wow. And then he, I was telling this story last night uh, uh, with, with these drummers that we hang with, and he, and he was, he, he had loaned Philip Wilson, who was great. Philip Wilson was another great drummer. It was Man. originally with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, okay. but he was there with Lester Bowie's Brass Fantasy that year at the festival. And 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 uh, he and he said, "I loaned Philip some brushes." He goes, "You know, I've had those brushes for twenty five years." <laughs> and we're like, "What?" Wow. I mean, twenty five days back then for a pair of brushes that didn't look end up looking like a yeah. medieval torture device was a yeah. miracle. He goes, and, and so we said, "Well, Mr. Lewis, do you think you'll get him back?" And he goes, "Oh." I'll get them back. <laughs> the other thing, the other one, you'll see, you'll love this. He, he had just start. They just started making the Istanbul symbols for him. Okay. So 83, 84. And he's playing the hi-hats. He goes, you hear these hi-hats? I said, yeah. He goes, they're the best. <laughs> wow, man. But I mean, it wasn't like, he, yeah. he just was proud of what he did. And man, he was uh, so imaginative. He did a, they did a workshop. I think it was like they put the All Star Band together. So I think it was him, Harvey, S. S yeah. Pete Chrislieb, and and uh, the Tonight Show piano player. Um, what's that? I, I can think of his name. And uh, Ross Tompkins. Okay. And, and so and then I think somebody else, good trumpet player. I can't remember. So uh, they did, they each did a little solo thing. And Mel said, "For mine, I'd like to play Body and Soul." Hmm. so we played a ballad and that was one of and then we talk about these life-changing moments that mm -hmm. was one so i do that now I, I always play ballads and when i as on the, when i do solo drum things i always play ballads and then dewey always had dewey redmond in my 12 mm -hmm. years of playing with dewey he always had me improvise on the ballads he knew i liked to wow. do it so wow. you know yeah it was it was very very cool man that's really it first of all you're just like a walking encyclopedia but what's interesting to me sort of the two things that kind of resonate the most is you are heavily or you are heavily influenced by drummers that were showmen you know and i i think i didn't understand that until now like sort of the older school kind of swing drummers because i think i i see you as someone who's so incredibly imaginative um you know and then you talk about just the amount of drummers you got to play or excuse me, got to hear play. How, what do you think that, uh, or I should say the absence of that has contributed to like today, you know, where, you know, I think the, the older drummers from that era that I got to see was probably just Elvin. Max was yeah. still alive when I got to New York I never got to see Billy Higgins. So how do you think that has shifted sort of drumming? Um, and do you think it's positively or negatively that most of us, particularly my generation, hasn't had a chance to see you know philly joe or some of these these wonderful uh drummers yeah well i think it's too, I, I think i mean i don't think anything is you know negative i mean you okay. know it's, it's evolution you know i mean it's just mm. the way i mean we didn't i mean we had more opportunity to see it we you this generation has a lot more possibilities of seeing them than i did i mean as far as just seeing them on the screen Right, right, you know, right, we, right. I had to look at pictures, man. I mean, every once right. in a while, there was a guy from University of Kansas that would bring down stuff, and we we would we saw that it was on film right. in 1982. We brought the stuff down every year for the festival. Right, right. Uh, it was his name, he, great collector of stuff, and we had video. We like, and it was like the <laughs> Sid Catlett plan, you know, yeah. with stuff. That's but now, I mean, come on, I mean, yeah. you can see we can see those. The, the difference is hearing it. Yeah, that's not yeah. From the source. I mean, I, right. I, I was telling the story, today, you know, yesterday teaching. I sat at the Willow Jazz Club in the summer of 1984, you know, four feet from Billy Higgins, like right in front of the drums. I went to Philly Joe. I went to see Elvin Jones um, 
at the, my first building I was ever in in New York City, these guys, I went down, I was living in Boston that summer studying with Ed Sof, and I went down to New York, and they just dropped me off at the Vanguard. They were going to a party, and they said, there's a village Vanguard. So the first building I was ever in was going down those stairs, and that was it. And so I saw wow. Elvin. The next night I saw Elvin again, and then I went to Lush Life, which is across the street from the village gate, you know. Yeah, on that corner, I don't know what wow. it is now, apartments or whatever. It was a Mexican restaurant for a long time. And I saw Philly Joe with Dan Maroney. Wow, wow. Yeah, and and uh, I have a photograph of that week from that band. There's a in the Brian McMillan from the West Coast. He was there, and so I, I bought a print of him of that week because I mm -hmm. was there that same you know summer. Lewis Hayes came by. Wow. Uh, Benny Green and Benny Green was there some of the nights. We, we never know. We talked. We, we thought maybe we were sitting at the bar, didn't even know each other. But wow. but Philly Joe came up to the bar and did the Bella Lugosi voice to order a cognac. Are you <laughs> so I was sitting right here and he's right there. And he goes, I like a double cognac, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I mean, like I was, I wrote postcards home. You know, I said, like, man, I. I'm checking it all out. And I met Elvin that first night. You know, you shook yeah. you shook his hand and you know, and you got that his cologne and you're like, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and like yeah. and then I I got to do a I got to see him a lot and I went to a record date of Elvin's hmm. um when I first moved to New York because Cecil McBee was on, I was playing with Cecil a lot. Mm -hmm. So he invited me and it was a, a record called I think it's called Record Don't Mean a Thing, it's on Inja. Mm -hmm. And it's with McBee and uh Nicholas Payton and Delphio and Willie Pickens and Sonny Fortune. Hmm. Kevin Hogan, he actually sings a couple tunes on it. Wow. Cool. Yeah. So, Matt, with, with all of this, man, all, all these in, incredible memories and, and just information, you know, what is your kind of philosophy about the drums, you know, in terms of how you started? Like, so did you kind of come to it saying, okay, I want to obviously, you know, learn my rudiments and learn, you know, to have a nice swing beat? Like, like when you, you know, sort of got sticks, what was that sort of, uh, you know, I guess, like, what was your North Star? Like, what was your goal a as a player? Because you clearly grew up hearing all these, you know, sort of the tradition bearers of the music. Yeah, but that, that came later because I, okay. I started playing pretty young. And so okay. I, I, you know, I got a, I got a snare drum and rock, a little cymbal. I still have it. And my thing was to play songs. So my brother ah. played saxophone. And so we would we would go to town because we live in the country. We, that's what we call it. We go to town. <laughs> we go to town and we'd go to we go to Byerly music. We'd buy sheet music every week. Hmm. We'd buy like hits of the 70, hits of 70, hits of 72, hits of 73. We buy individual pieces of sheet music. I have like Louis Louis, you know, brother Louis, Louis, yeah. Louis, Louis. That was one of our hits. We wow. play and we play duo. Uh, for 4-H meetings and PTA meetings and stuff, and we had shtick in the whole thing. Wow! Yeah, this all make, this is like all part of what you're doing now. Yeah, wow. it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So I I went about it. I didn't I didn't learn how to read. I didn't take lessons. I was there to play the song. You know, I want okay. to you know I would listen and go, okay, we're gonna play. Um, then then things started to go around. My brother was super, my middle brother was super helpful. And matter of fact, I tell the story all the time. He got me this great record set called The Drums. It's on Impulse. Mm -hmm. Three record set that Michael Cascuna and, and Ed Michelle put together of, of everything from their catalog from, 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 it's then from Baby Dodds up to Barry Alshul. Wow. At that motion, Sonny Murray with Albert Eiler, Bear, uh, Beaver Harris with Archie Shep. And so, but in between, there was there was Sid Catlett, there was Buddy, um, Louis Belson. The name of that record is Thunderbird, by the way. And and uh, Danny Richmond, um, all these people. Elvin wow. playing Shiny Stockings wow. with Richard Davis. And so I listened to those three records, and I just thought that that's what jazz drummers did. Okay. I thought it was you know I, from Baby Dodds. And I when I heard Ghost by Albert Eiler, it was different than that stuff. But I thought, well, that's what we're supposed to do. I didn't know I was supposed to. Sus uh, subscribe to a five-year period you know i mean literally i mean so i just was i got thrown into a lot of things and i and i did it by by learning by playing right. music you know and i and i jumped into gigs you know i started to play pretty regularly in eighth grade so my mm. parents would take me to these places and i'd play with these bands and uh, then i played a lot of private parties and stuff like that too so, so then you know before you're 18 uh what was the first gig for you like what you know you you said you played with your brother you did all these private parties but like what is that first gig that you would consider as kind of the beginning of your professional journey well i, I when i was just about 40 years ago this week 
I was in this rock band and we made a 45 and I'm going to post really? that stuff. This week. Oh yeah. man, I want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and, it, and, and one tune is like a, it, it was new wave bands, the period, you know, so I was really into that. I was really into like, I was really into ska bands, like the specials. And I was really into the talking heads and the gang of four and Bob Marley and, wow. and parliament, you know, I was really into all this stuff. And so I, I started, and I was playing with the symphony Part, some of the time in Galesburg, and I studied with Adam Larson's father, John. Okay, and he he steered me in a lot of great and got me a lot of you know opportunities. Okay, and so yeah, I was I was playing. So the first gig I would say, like that, I, yeah, I was kind of going out with that band, and I was playing, but I was in front of people all the time playing. So okay. I just I I just figured, man, I'm out doing this, and I'm putting some. I you know I didn't have to work a job. I didn't have. I was doing yeah. this, you know, and I was teaching. Yeah. And, and I like the culture of the, you know, the other thing Ulysses is I, is I tell a lot is that I was a, vi a victim. My brother too, he, he ended up being one of the preeminent like scenic stage, you know, lighting people in the Midwest. He, they cut the art, they cut those programs when we were mm. in school. You know, he was a few years older than me. So we had, a, we didn't have high school jazz, man. Wow. Which is probably good because man. it made, it forced me to go out into the community. So I learned man. from these older musicians. And I oh. learned, I learned the culture, you know, I learned, right. even though it was, you know, Gelsberg, you know, yeah, scene, yeah. man, there were some really good players, you know, really wow. good players. They could really play. They turned me on to cool records and, yeah. and all kinds of things, you know? So my journey of that was, you know, always through playing, you know, playing songs. So I was, you know, when I was eighth grade, ninth grade, I used tunes like Just In Time, yeah. um, Dancing on the Ceiling, uh, from playing these games with, with those folks. I knew those tunes, you know? Man. So, Yeah. Man, and so, I learned the and, music. And so in terms of your formal education, you know, you weren't in high school band. So, you know, who taught you the rudiments? Who taught you, you know, even playing traditional? You know, because I mean, when I watch her playing and, and, and take it in, all that stuff is there. You know, like, did you learn Wilcoxon? Did you, you know, did you kind of go through the sort of usual thing? No, that, I didn't okay. really. Okay. I mean, okay. I, I, with John, we worked on, you know, thing with John Larson. He was really a imaginative teacher. He played bass with me a lot. So when I learned okay. the Bossa Nova beat, for example, it wasn't from a sheet. We, we had a sheet, but he would play bass with me. And we hmm. would play, and that's how I learned to play in two. He'd play in two on the bass, and I'd hmm. tip on the cymbal. So he had a lot from, from playing. So, but I worked on, you know, later I worked on more of that stuff. With Ed, I worked on Soph. I worked on, like, Rebound, Molar. Okay. You know, that oh, right, thing right. was very right. pivotal. That okay. summer of 84 for me, summer of 84 was probably one of the most pivotal things because I was studying with him. I got a National Endowment grant. I studied with him. It's the first time I was in New York, first time I was in Boston area. You know, okay. I took some lessons with Alan Dawson. Also, okay. I I saw Elvin, Philly Joe, Ayerto, Terry okay. Lynn. Okay, so um, that was kind of the launch, the launch year for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was all, I was 19 years old, and it was you know that I mean that was something else. You know, I mean, that, and I knew that's what, you know I knew what I wanted to do from from my yeah. youth, but that really you know galvanized like okay, this is I, I dig this. You know, I saw so much great music too. Yeah. You know? And then so, you move, and then you move to New York. Like, what what was that that journey? Like, after you you had this sort of eighty summer or year of eighty four. Like, what what was then the next process? Yeah, I was at Wichita State doing that. So I stayed an extra year after college. I graduated in eighty six. I stayed an extra year because I was playing in this band that was working all the time hmm. with a jazz violinist with Michael Cox. You know Michael Cox, tenor player Michael. from uh, jazz from Columbus, uh, and uh, Dwight Killian, a great bass player, lives in Phoenix, and Gordon Shaw, a great guitar player, that's around Denver. We had this band. We were we were working three hundred nights a year, so we were playing all the time. Wow! I mean, wow. my we were my, you know my rent was ninety bucks a month, and we would make that in a couple <laughs> of the nights. So wow. man, I was you know, I was probably doing better than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, instead of the band. But, yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. we were playing. So I stayed an extra year, and my wife. Well, we weren't married yet, but Felisa was finishing her degree. She got an education degree also. She did her master's at NEC. So we moved to Boston. And we lived in Somerville first. We were in Boston for five years. And when the first weekend I met John Modeski hmm. and a few other folks, and then that's how I got, you know, he connected me with the either orchestra and then Charlie Colhase. And, and I was playing with a lot of people there. So I was in, we were in Boston for five years okay. from 87 until the August of, of, on, of 92. So hmm. we've, we've been in New York since for 19 years or for 29 years. Wow. 29 wow. Years. Yeah. Wow, first man. we lived in Brooklyn. Okay. And then there, you know, then things started to happen. I was going back and forth a lot. And then, you know, things like, I, you know, getting, getting, I was playing in Boston. That's why Dewey first heard me. And then yes. that connection really helped. And then McBee, I was playing with stuff with McBee and that helped. And then 
Lee Konitz, and then you know the the then this right. thing started happening. You know that so, that so- way. So with all these different gigs, because, you know, in a, in a little bit, as I was researching your bio earlier and, and even some of the gigs I've seen you play, you have this laundry list of people you played with. What would you say for you were some keys to being able to play with these great artists? Obviously, you learn how to play songs, you learn how to play with bands. But, you know, you go from that playing with your brother and all these other even working bands to Cecil McBee, Lee Conus, these are legends. So what are maybe some keys that when you sat on the kit, obviously, in addition to what they told you that help you to make sure that you could keep these relationships for, for those years. Wow. Yeah. I think it was because, because, you know, I had done my, you know, I'd done my homework, you know, like I, I remember, I, I remember the first time I played with Charlie Hayden, for example, or the first time I, I was singing a bassist, you know, or the first time I played with Eddie Gomez, I played along with them on records so much that I felt like I had been okay. there. So, so we got to go deeper in that. Cause I, I get these questions all the time where drummers are like, man, you know, h- how can I play with so-and-so? And I'm like, well, have you played along to them on record? So can you maybe go a little deeper into the homework element of, of that? You know, what you just talked about playing along with these musicians first and their recordings. So by the time you got on stage, you kind of understood their language. Yeah. You know? Oh, for sure. And, and, you know, Jeff Hamilton is one of my mentors, you know, he told me years ago, wow. who do you want? To-? My first, his first question in the first lesson I took with him at Wichita State was, who do you want to play with? It wasn't like this or that. Who do you want to play with? I said, I'd like to play. I said, one of them was Dewey. I said, I'd like wow. to play with Phil Woods. So we'll learn their music. So mm-hmm. the first time I met Dewey at the airport, I knew all the songs. I was ready to go. You know, I knew all the music. And so then I think part you... of it is knowing the music. So I learned it. Yeah. You know, I learned it. I would learn to to to, to, to write things out, you know, get okay. them figured out, you know, know the music, learn it. I can I can learn things pretty quickly. And I, and I also... Um, if, if, if I'm very visual, so if I hmm. if I write it, I see it, you know. So okay. I'm very connected that way. So sometimes if I look at something, I can get it down pretty fast, and I can remember it, you know. And uh, so I did that. I would make little notes and you know, stuff. But also, I went with doing. You know, I went in with like, okay, I can either go in and be careful, or just go for it. Uh-huh. And I went. I just went in and played and. Oh, and he asked me to join the band on the way home. You know, on at the uh-huh. airport. He was saying, you know, so I do. I did. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I played along with those those records and just listen a lot. You know what I mean? Right. And also back then, you know, we didn't couldn't afford to buy thirty, you know, or we didn't have the stuff online, so we would listen to that Sphere record over mm-hmm. and over again. Right, right. You know, right, right, instead right. of you know, or one track. Or I must have listened to that if I should lose you, you know, a thousand times. You know, that's wow. on that on the first Sphere record, and then. You know, when I saw them play it live, too, they came, they came to Wichita Jazz Festival. I got to play with Charlie Rouse. We brought Charlie Rouse to Wichita wow. State, too, so that was cool. But I did, yeah, I knew, you know, I did that. I, but I was always, you know, I was working, you know, I mean, I was playing yeah. music, and, and I and I wanted to serve, well, you know, and I, you know, I've got, you know, I believe me, I got, I got right through the coals a lot, too. I mean, like, yeah. people like, what are you doing, you know? And yeah. I remember, you know, just little things like that. I remember one time, when we were back in Galesburg uh, with, for, with the Sandberg project and I went around with Letterer and Don, Don Thompson showing kind of things. Okay. This is where this happened. I said, see that nursing home over there. That's why I was playing the gig where I learned about playing on the form because I wanted to play a drum solo. And I was playing with this lady named March Fanny and I was begging, can I play a drum solo? It sounded like probably through like 15 drum sets down the stair. And she pulled me aside <laughs> afterwards. And she goes, she goes, young man, what in the hell were you doing over there? I said, I was playing my solo. She goes, well, we were playing Sweet Georgia Brown. I don't know what you were playing. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I didn't know. I was 14 yeah. years old, 13 years old. I said, oh, I just thought you just, you know. So that's yeah. when I learned, like, okay, learn these songs, learn to right. play the melodies, learn the, you know, learn them and, and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that you talked about that because, you know, one of the cool things at Open Studio is, uh, you know, this audience is full of, you know, a mixture of people, right? You've got drummers who, you know, are fans, but then you've also got sort of students at, at various ages and they're always trying to figure out how do I get better. And so I love that you talked about, you know, taking these records and, and learning them. And I, I want to go a little deeper even into that of, okay, so let's take Dewey Redmond. Do you go and you say at that time, especially cause we didn't have Spotify, do you, you know, pull the 10 or 15 records he may have put out at that time. And you literally are going down every track and you're notating. Is that how you were learning people's yeah. discographies? Or what? Yeah. I learned, you know, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I knew the two. Like, I knew Thren. I knew, you know, I knew I knew his tune. You know, I just I, wow. I knew the blueses. I knew that he was going to play the musette. So I, you know, hmm. I had these you know African feels that I had together mm-hmm. already. And yeah, and you know, I, and and um, you know, he 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 gave me his number, and I called him every month for a year and a half because I wow. wanted to play with. Him. 
you know. Wow. So finally, he needed somebody. If wow. I wouldn't, have, if I would have said, "Oh, he's just, you know, yeah. he's just, he's just saying that." Yeah. But you know, he finally picked it. You know, he picked up one day and said, "What are you doing, December third, fourth, and 5th? I said, "Nothing." <laughs> and we went to Toronto. I remember asking this other day. I said, "Are we going to drive?" Because you know, I was used to either yeah. orchestra. Or he goes, "Drive." No, drive. We're going to fly. I was like, "Wow, that was a whole new level for wow. me." Because either orchestra, wow. you know, we. We traveled the U.S. in vans, you know, right. so we were you know, all over the place. So it was kind of the first time I, you know, I was a little older for me. I yeah. wasn't like super young doing that stuff. So, I mean, you know, and then you know, then the, the recording came up. But for me, the, the again, it was always about um, working on the mechanics to get to the music, not the other mm -hmm. way around. You know, I mean, you know, the music was telling me, OK, I need to work on this stuff in. And, and Ed was great. I mean, Ed, the, the summer of that, that, that's when I really got, you know, he okay. really helped me a lot with mechanics, you know, yeah. and just about getting a sound. I think if, if, if anybody with touch, he was one. I also took one great lesson with the great George Marsh. Uh, wow. He really helped me uh, out about how to sit. Oh, talk about that. Well, he has this great book called Inner Drumming, and he mm. a lot of it was like planning planning your sitting bones, and he, and he was like he advocated sitting out near the edge of the seat so you don't roll your back. So one of the wow. reasons I have this trunk thing this way a lot was because of George, and then this flow thing that he had between the limbs. And what was really what was really beautiful about all that is that he redid this book and put it out, and I actually wrote a little portion on the back of that, yeah. like while well, one lesson changed, you know, changed me. He really opened me up about the flow between the limbs, you know. He had this wow. whole Tai Chi sort of way of even mm. drawing it. And he's a really imaginative, you know, uh, teacher. So he was great. Andrew Cyril, I took a couple lessons with him, and he's one of the ones that really encouraged me to move to New York. I would take a lesson with him when he came to Boston. Mm. And he'd go, man, you should, why don't you, why are you come to New York, man? You're ready to come to New York. And so, you know, he was really, uh, and still is a big, you know, a big mm. influence. I love him, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and then through, you know, through guys like that. And then Kenny Washington, I would talk to a lot when he was in, uh, in in Boston back in those days, you know, because I had met him in Wichita mm -hmm. and Bill Goodwin a lot, you know, yeah, from Phil Woods, yeah. Spanish, still keep in touch with Bill quite a bit. And Billy Hart was a big influence mm -hmm. in Remains. Yeah. So, and then Jeff, you know, Jeff, I talked to like all the time. I mean, I try to keep in touch with him all the time. You know, yeah. what I mean? he's one of those people that, you know, that, yeah, he, he knew I was interested and he helped me, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's good to see people that, that, that remain curious, you know, and, yeah. and I still, I'm still, I've, I've had you know, the pandemic was a lot welcome me to like work on things, you know, so I've been, right. I feel good, you know, that, right. You know, no, like, <laughs> look out. <laughs> no, I love it. So man, so now that we've kind of talked a little bit about your beginning, I, you know, one of the things that's always fascinated me about you is I feel like I knew of who you were as a drummer. And then all of a sudden I feel like you became this very prominent band leader. So can you maybe talk a little bit about when you were playing with all these other artists, were you sort of logging these ideas of, Hey, if I ever lead a band, here's what I will do. Or if I ever made my records or, you know, cause I started listening to your discography from the first, uh, one of the first records I, I got hip to, I think it's as the way follows or as, yeah, way as way follows, follows way. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, how do you go from Dewey Lee, all this other stuff to, now you're making your own projects. And then I feel like from as way follows, then there's arts and crafts. So can you yeah. maybe talk about how did you build a concept of what you wanted to do as a drummer band leader? And then obviously this large body of work of over a dozen records that you've created thus far. Thank you. I, you know, that came by a little bit by accident in a way, at least the first record thing, but band leading. Yeah. I was always, you know, I saw when I saw our Blakey, you know, and I, and I, hmm. I liked the way the, I liked, with the with the drummer way would be the leader it's talk and be the you know and be mm -hmm. you know be that person and and i like the balance of both i mean now and now it's kind of it depends on what year it is you know sometimes it's more sidemen things or there's more right whatever right. cypress things and then other times it's that but i like i like the balance of of both and then i you know i was around some cool band leaders even there even even before that like charlie cole hayes in boston and russ gershon leader either orchestra very cool band leaders i mean we we, that, that band was, I just listened to, when I was driving my son up to school at Brockport, I went back and listened to a bunch of these early, either orchestra recordings. Mm -hmm. And man, they're, they're really cool. And the great thing about my time in Boston was I got to record a lot. Mm -hmm. So I already played on a bunch of records there, a bunch of different people, Charlie's records, either orchestra, right? you know, you know, a lot of folks, singers, all kinds of things. So I was, you know, I was in there doing that and I watched how people, what I tell people, my students all the time is who do you want to be as an artist and what do you not want to be as an artist? And you can oh, learn wow. those things 
from by watching people. You can see like, wow, I really like the vibe that, that this person gives off. So, you know, see that, emulate it. That's when I saw Billy Higgins. I was like, man, I want to be that. I, wow. It wasn't as much as the hand. It was just like that spirit. Yeah, the spirit that's yeah, what I yeah. wanted to be. And and it was also that was attainable to me. You know, that was mm. but I, I felt. But not to not to discount or diminish anything, but I was like, well, that I connected to that. But but band leading wise, I knew and I like putting together, you know, it's funny, um, a few about a, a couple months ago, we were up at the uh teaching Litchfield Jazz Camp. And I was mm-hmm. telling some guys, I said, you know, when I was younger, my mom would write little things in the paper about, you know, we saw Matthew play and it was a program of these songs where he was accompanying people. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, mom, I'm playing gigs, okay? I'm not playing programs. I'm not. But now I use the same language. I like a nice program of music and I like accompanying people, you know? So wow. I like the, I, I always like about how people create an interesting evening of music, take you on a journey. You know, and so that's one of the things as a band leader that I that I always dug. And I like I like the whole process. I like trying to get the gigs. I like okay. getting to the gigs. I like the traveling. I like the camaraderie. Right. I like I love making records. I like doing promotion stuff about them coming up with, yeah. you know, like the uh, going once, going, tw- go tw- you know, uh, or, or uh, humidity. We had. um uh, ice scrapers mm-hmm. uh, uh, going once, going twice. We had uh, temporary tattoos. That's going to leave a mark. I made pencils uh, art with honey and salt. We had bookmarks. You know, I like coming up with all these different things that go along with the two marketing. You know, Combs was really good. Dr. Combs was really great at that wow. because, you know, he was tired of having people not come to these percussion ensemble concerts. So you, you, you create a piece with wrestlers. People are going to come. You got to create. Is, wow. You got to create, you got to, you got to, you know, it's, you got to make it an event. And all the band leaders that I work for that I really admire, you know, Dewey, um, Joe Lovano, John Schofield, you know, these, you know, you know, Andrew Hill, you know, these folks, Charlie, we create, they created events, you know, hmm. it was, it was, you know, Dewey did an interesting evening of music. It wasn't just, you know, it was, yeah. and he was very, you know, and entertaining is not a bad word. Entertaining mm. means you're being gracious. If you're entertaining folks at your house, you're not doing a put on a show. You're being gracious. You're saying, hey, would you like something to eat? Would you like a beverage, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So as a performer, when you're entertained, I don't think about entertaining all that much as that. And, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's been a trial and error. No, <laughs> you know, I, a lot I, of things. <laughs> but yeah. a lot of things now, a lot of it now, it's just the event. You know, I love the event. I just put a festival on in my backyard. You know, the Avant Yard Festival. I did a solo concert <laughs> in the community garden this summer. You know, part of wow. it for me is, part of it for me is, is creating the event. I love that you brought up entertainment because I feel like, especially in my generation, I feel like, you know, uh, they took sort of the miles, you know, turning his miles Davis, turning his back to the audience as we have to be serious and we have to, you know, kind of exclude the audience. But I love this idea that entertainment should be part of what we do. So I love that you talked about that, you know, because I see that like, you know, I remember seeing you, I think one of the first times was like one of the drum festivals and, you know, just everything about your presentation was so you know, like you said, it was this larger than life thing. So it's really interesting to hear that that's that's a conscious choice for you. Yeah, but but the mu- but but the music is. Can you hear that? You're not. Yeah, it's cool that, though. Right? It's yeah, cool though. Oh, it's cool. It's, it's music school. Um, but but, the, <laughs> but but it's it's never at the. It's never ever at the. Yeah. At the, 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 the to me, that means you got to have the music at an even incredible, really higher level. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the people that just almost. I don't like the word almost. I don't like the word just. And I think huh. what happens is, is we have, we have not sometimes, and if I want, if I have a little bit of a soapbox thing, I think sometimes college thing has, has the seriousness of it has diminished the, the level of excellence. Wow. 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 You know, man. I mean, you know, like when, are, when are things are, wow, really good. Like let's, you know, sometimes I say to students, this is good enough. Would you pay to come and hear this? Do you want, wow. do you want it? Do you want it? Is, yeah. Can't we get this to be even better? And yeah. so we've, I've never let the, you know, the music is always at the highest level, but if you can do both and if you can reach people at the same time, you know, man, I, I think that's so hip because I, I feel like every time I've seen you, it is entertaining. It is like, uh, it, it, it brings you in, you know, to the moment. And it also makes you feel like you've probably never experienced music on that level. So, so with that said, like when you think about a concept of a record or a band, what is like, you know, your first like three or four thoughts, you know, is it, you know, is it okay? I want to, you know, 
enlighten them with this or you know like how do you because to me you're one of the greatest concept creators out here so well, like thank you arts and crafts came about because i want to do something a little bit different the quartet actually the quartet came about the okay. two horns bass and drums came about because it was easier to tour ah uh, yeah of course economics <laughs> well man he didn't have to have a piano yeah. which was hard to find back then you know yeah. and we could we could set up anywhere we could set up right here yeah you know yeah yeah and so we could we could go play all these places so the original wow. you know Band. Well, the first we went through different things for Sam Newsom and, and Joel, and, and then it was Andrew D'Angelo and Joel and Yosuke anyway for a long time. And then Joel left, and it was Jeff, and they're still in the family, and Jeff and and uh, Andrew, and then Kirk Konevsky. And then wow. Joe, Yosuke moved back to Japan, and so Lightcap. And wow. so I had different people play all the time. Yeah. And Joel still come back. Everybody comes back and plays it. You know, yeah. but I mean, but I mean, and then Archer Cross, I wanted something. I, I had been playing with Dennis Irwin. I knew I wanted to build a band around him. And then I played with Terrell once. And I said, man, I got it. This guy has to be in the group. And then wow. I love playing with Larry. So I got, you know, I got Goldens. And we made that record um, in 2000, uh, in 2000, October of 2000, just a few hmm. weeks, a few days after I found out we were having triplets. So that was another. So, you know, I had to, so it was all these things. But. And then, then that became what was funny is that one. I felt that one was going to be more of a repertoire, like more traditional, whatever that means. And it's funny because it kind of did this. Mm. Arts and Crafts got weirder, and the quartet got a little more mainstream. Right, you know, right, as right, far right. as whatever that, I don't even think about those terms. I think about music. And now, yeah. you know, it's changed for me. I think it's changed for us in general that we have these. It's a little less of those boundaries. Yeah. You know, it's cool to play a Gershwin tune. It's cool to play an Ornette tune. It's cool to play something of yours. Right, it's cool right. to play a Duke Pearson tune. It's cool to play, you know, I like the repertoire. That's why I like Ken Popowski or something like that. He finds great right. repertoire to play. Right. So, right. you know, and then, you know, and then the bands just started. And then the Honey and Salt came along. And I thought that was going to be, you know, the Carl Samberg thing. I yeah. thought that was going to be kind of set almost. And for, you know, I thought at first, oh, man, we're going to. And that's become one of the most open things that we do because we got so comfortable with the material that we can yeah. really stretch it and do all kinds of things. Yeah. So that welcomed it in a different way. So I like these different things going on. And I thought yeah. it was kind of cool to have different projects to have going on at different times you know man on. so what so with that said like i mean you you've done so much you you've experienced so much and you've also you, it seems like you're always pushing boundaries so what what else is there that you want to explore that you haven't you know in terms of band oh, or yeah i want to make uh there's a record um that i want to make um trio with um with a, a great trumpet player whose first name is ron and a really great <laughs> No, Miles, no, no. and there's a really great bass player whose last name is Mr. Carter. <laughs> that would be killing. So that, that's on the agenda. Um, I want to, I, I'm, I, you know, because yeah, I just I, I've never played with them. I want to experience them. We're you know we're friendly, we're cool. And then yeah, there's other thing, you know. And then also, I just want to keep documenting. I think it's really important. What I learned about the, the pandemic is document as much as I can. So wow. you know, I'm going to try to take do some other duet recordings i i kind of interested in in, in having uh, a piano trio in a way so okay. and, and then and, and then a youth band i'm really that's that's one of the yeah. main things right now and i have a i have a few lineups of those so i'm kind of yeah. you know moving that around i think it's time that you know it's great to, you know, and i've been playing with i played a gig last week at the 55 bar with john cousin who's a student of mine the new school great bass player yeah yeah and man he put the, i was so proud of him he put together such a great evening of music i was yeah, so i mean yeah. it was calling me his jazz uncle <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of my wow. new hand so i love it you know so i've been able to apprentice with masters i've been able to play with my peers and i was able to apprentice with people in between those peers two people like ray anderson and you know and myra melford and yeah. dresser and, and osby and some folks like that yeah. and then you know and then uh, my peers, of course, and then now these younger folks. Man, you know, I, I love I love getting to be the old guy on the bandstand. You know, man, I love I love, that. <laughs> I love it. I've, I got some questions um, from sure. some of the the viewers. One is um, Jacob Starling, and he's asking, "Do you have any specific stories? You you touched on a little bit of this, but any stories about your time with Charlie Hayden?" Man, so so many great ones. You know. Charlie heard everything, you know, and, uh, and man, it, 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 he was, he was, I mean, it was, wow, what a gift, you know, to hear, to play that ride symbol with that sound, you know, mm. just to hear that. Yeah. So one time we were in, we were, we were making the record 
in Rome. We just got to making the record. We were playing an outdoor concert. Of course, I had the plexiglass around me for, for Charlie. Well, I was used right. to that at that point. Right. And I would, what I would do is set up turns so my I could see my symbol and then, you know, my main right and see him too at the same time. So I could hear him, but I could see it, you know. Mm-hmm. But we had a French horner in the band who, who said that they, she thought, they thought that the drums were kind of affecting their chops. So they put plexiglass in front of me. Wow. So I was basically in a cage. Wow. wow. I never do anything like this. <laughs> I never. So. Yeah. We were rehe- we were sound checking, and they had to keep turning me up in the monitors to hear me because I was back. So it was it was diminishing returns at this point. Yeah. So I put the sticks down, and I went back to Charlie's playing, and I said, "Charlie, I love you with all my heart, man, but I'm not going to play in a box." And and he he stops and he goes, "Take it away, man." take the stuff away. And we just had the stuff a little bit around me. Yeah. And then one night I was playing in LA at a rock club with liberation. Yeah. And I, I have, I had a solo that I would try to do something crazy each, every time. Yeah. Didn't want to repeat anything. So I put, I s- strapped the snare drum on and I marched the audience out into the street. It was two doors. They had an entrance on each side. And I marched the band, the, the, the audience <laughs> out into the street and I marched them back into the club. Wow. And I thought, okay, it's, it was fun. It was a good run. You know, yeah. anyway, I, I hope everything's okay. You know, yeah. I look back at Charlie and Charlie looks at me and he goes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it very well could have been, you know, the last night. But, it yeah. was, you know, <laughs> but you know, we have the same, we have similar stories. He, right. He had a son first and then triplet daughters. And I had a daughter first and then triplet sons. Wow. 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 And we wow. have pictures of the, the pictures. And matter of fact, uh, sadly, his his widow passed away on nine eleven just a few wow. days ago on September eleventh. So um, you know, yeah, uh, God, bless. God bless her. She was a great human being, and we had more years of Charlie because of her. And she was a she was a great artist in her in her own right, great singer. But she kept that band together. You know, she even after Charlie had passed, we had done some stuff and like that. So with with Carla and Steve and everything like that. But my time with him, yeah. And then there was a concert we played with Dewey Trio at the uh, Montreal Jazz Festival, which was everything is always documented mm-hmm. there, as you know, not yeah. documented. So, but I, I actually stopped Ulysses in the concert, dropped out, let them play, and I reached down and I pinched myself and I said, yeah. I said to myself <laughs> out loud, wow. I am actually here. I mean, that to me was a dream. Wow, wow, because wow. of old and new dreams and and all that yeah. ornate music to be wow. on the bandstand like that with those right. guys. And I picked the set. They're like, you pick the music for me. Whoa. So they really trusted me, and I had oh, it was great. No, man, I love that. Um, we got uh Robert. Yeah, sorry. Powell. No, no, it's cool, man. I mean, I I wish I could keep you here for three hours because you, you have so much information. Um, and no, I love it. Robert Powell is uh asking, uh, is Trio Arc one of your favorite albums that you played on? Trio Arc. Is that is um is is that a Faulkner Evans record? I, the, this is what he 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 said. Trio Arc. It, so maybe it, it or may be or is that record. or. Or is it, or is that a Mario Pavone? I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the title. So, Robert, is. you have to maybe uh, clarify that. Who's the, the artist? Like, who's the artist? Yeah, who's the artist, Robert? Put that in the comments. Um, while, while we're waiting on that, because I know we're unfortunately running out of time, but I, I'd love for you to to share with us, Matt. What are you thinking about? Obviously, you told me the record you're preparing for, but what are you thinking about jazz today? Obviously, given the pandemic, we we're still in the midst of, you know, what do you, what do you think about the power of music and just any thoughts you want to share about, you know, what you're looking forward to and just kind of the state of where, where we are as, as a community in this music, you know, given what you've, I mean, you've lived through so many interesting periods in, in the music. You know? This is, this has been a challenging one, you know, but you know what, I think, you know, I, I'm never one to hold back, but now, man, you got to go for, what are we waiting for? Wow. You want to put together a project, do it, figure out a way yeah. to do it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm down like, these are these events, you know, the, you know, letter and I talk about this and you got to surround yourself with people. You know, the other thing, Ulysses, you know this, and I want the people to know this. Nobody does this by themselves. So you got to get trust in people that believe in, and, and we'll go, hmm, okay, let's try it. You know, yeah. there's a t-shirt that I really love. I got to get some that said, um, that's a, that's a, that's a dumb idea. What time do you want me there, or something like that? <laughs> you know, I like that. I love, you know, like yeah. letter night. Letter, letter is one of those wow. people for me. He's involved with my court, the quartet, honey and salt, yeah. Christmas trio. We arranged this music recently for yeah. the Kansas All State Band of three themes I've written that was dedicated to Representative John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, called the Good Trouble Suite. Wow. And we put that all together, and these kids from Kansas played the. 
hell out of it. You mm. know, so I like, you know, I, these things keep me going, you know, yeah. I think, and I love teaching for that same reason. Like I, you know, I want them to put things. The answer mm. is yes. If it's legal, that's my whole thing. Yeah. Man, I know could, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. You got to, you know, what do we, people sometimes, well, you know, if I get better, you know, that's true, but man, you're going to only get better by going out and doing it. Right. Sit in your practice room, put the bands together, put some, write, write right. some music, right. get in front of people. You know, rock, my young students that were are rock players, they go out and play. Jazz just sit home and wait. Woo! What are you waiting for, man? Look at you. Ideas, you know, come up with something. Wow. Don't be, wow. you know, don't be lazy, you know, like yeah. figure out some things, you know, you and also serve the community. If everybody, everybody has these things, mm. you know, like, oh, we got to go out and do this. Play a concert. If everybody played a concert in their town, it'd be better, right? Man. If everybody out there put yeah. on a concert or presented somebody in their town, that would help. And I do this stuff in my town and it helps get people, man, we get, we've got a, like a scene out near me now, you know, right, between right. stuff, you know, and we had 70, 70 people at this about yard festival we had you know james francis played yeah cardinus and all these folks right 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 you know and sarah caswell and right and a bunch of students came and played and you know you gotta yeah we gotta you know you gotta we gotta do things you know you, my dad used to say ulysses let's do something even if it is wrong <laughs> That's man. That's so heavy, man. Um, Robert just got back to us. Okay. It, was the, it was the Paul Blay and Mario Pavone. Uh, Very cool yeah. record. Yeah, I'm thinking it was that one. Uh, you know, Mr. Blay um, passed away a few years ago, yeah. and we just lost Mario Pavone within the last month wow. or so, a couple months. Wow. And we gathered at System Studio to do that. And uh, I had played with with Paul Blay with with Lee Konitz before, and so I kind of knew, you know, mm. what the vibe was. But man, that it was really fun. Really, really fun. Man. And uh, we cool. got a lot of good music out of that that day. That's that was an event, you know. And yeah. I played with 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 Mr. Blay uh, another time, another couple of times, you know, with Lee. So that was fun. Yeah, that was beautiful. And he man. called me for some gigs. I couldn't do him, unfortunately, but he was great to get to play with. Yeah. Well, man, I I I wish I could keep you here all day, but I know we we've got a, a limit of time. Um, I know we're gonna share some music that you've given uh, the team. Uh, can you maybe just set that up? Let us know what we're gonna see. I think you gave a little video or something. I can't wait to check it out. But um, I, I appreciate you for being on. But yeah, just maybe tell us a little bit about what we're gonna check. Yeah, out. before we do that, thank you again. I mean, you know, oh, there, you're a great example for you know for people. We can sit around and and complain, yeah. or we can do something about it. You know what I mean, and so, I you know movers and shakers and 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 and, and people acolytes for positivity and and, and you know people want to hear it. You know, people want to hear it. You know, I mean, we got to go out and 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 bring the people there and get them there. So mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing, I think this has been good. And when, when now that we're back, people really, I think we're going to see. I hope we see a, a revolution of powerful new music it seems like i mean there's a lot of cool rec records coming out one of which is this one uh, there's a bunch of new things coming out um that i'm on and this is one of them is this new record by jeff letter called sun sun it's by his band sun watcher eightfold okay. stories and it's um myself and jeff obviously and uh the great steve swallow and jamie mm -hmm. Saff. and we recorded it in the summer of august of 20 out at jamie's studio but jeff and i were out in the yard to record so you hear you hear crickets on it we had we got <laughs> i was telling you earlier we had a rain delay we had to cover up mm. there weren't my drums fortunately i had a little bass drum with me there but we mm. covered up the drums and we we kept the record going and this record is really cool and then there's a new record of mary's wife that's coming out at the same time of of music that she's written lyrics to eric dolphy's music wow. so nick, nick dunston the great young bass players on that and Tamika Reed is on cello, and Patricia yeah. Brennan, and Jeff plays clarinet, and uh, Bobby Sanabria is on a cut, and Jimmy oh, nice. Bosch. So it's a nice mix of music. So those two records. But this one of Jeff's, I'm really into, and I play, it's really organic, and we're outside, and I, I really like the results of it. It's, it's different. You know, I, I like different cool, kinds man. of challenges. So thank you, Ulysses. Thank you. I man. love you, man. And, and you too, the, man. And, and uh, all the times, you know, back in the past, seeing each other on the road. And, yeah. So, man, this cat has got something going on. And Sildjian events and all that kind of thing. So we well, are very kind. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you. Thank right. you, Matt. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us and uh, have a great uh, rest of your week. Cool. So, Take care, Matt. All right, thank you. Care. See you, baby. Ciao. Thank you. And uh, I'll just say for those that are still here, that was, man. Um, that was an earful and uh, just something I think that I want to share that Matt left us with um, as we get ready to go into the track that he's going to allow us to, to, to check out is I, I think what resonated with me the most was his last comment of get out there, 
and create. Um, please get out there and create. Uh, I know some of us are in the U.S. I see a couple others, uh, Adam from Groningen and others from all over the world. I think if we can ever, you know, sort of uh, hold on to something, I think the power of creativity and not waiting or asking for permission to do so is what will make the world continuously a better place because we all know the powerful uh, conduit that music can can be and serve as a healing uh, bomb. So thank you all. We'll be here again next week at five o'clock. Uh, but man, please check out as much Matt Wilson uh, music or things that he has been part of or albums that he's played on. And thank you. I'm Ulysses Owens and uh, check us out next week. And uh, we'll leave you with this wonderful track from Matt Wilson. Take care.